What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, we've wanted to talk about this for some time, sort of a pay homage to the movie that really just took it to another level, Brian. Chris Evans, I hope you're watching. Sebastian Stan, even you, Samuel L. Jackson, I forgive you, even though you gave us an atrocious performance in Secret Invasion. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But that movie, Brian... It impacted me in a way that escape into this world where there's stakes, there are, there's drama, there's reveals, there's, there's performances that pay off those reveals. Because we all knew it was, it was, it was that situation. We all knew that, the, how this story was gonna go, but the performances paid it off, Brian. I'm talking about this movie, Winter Soldier. Yeah. The Winter Soldier is the number one movie that the MCU has made. I don't care what other movie you think. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Brian, let's talk about the Winter Soldier. What your your thoughts after seeing the movie for the first time? So we're celebrating a 10 year anniversary. Just crossed the 10 year anniversary of the theatrical release of what Pablo and I agree. And I think a lot of people, we are not on an island on this one, that this is the pinnacle of Marvel superhero filmmaking. This is as good as we've got. We've had good. We've, that's not to say we haven't had other good. Iron Man 1, the Avengers 1, 3, and 4, Spider-Man No Way Home. We've had, we've had it. Guardians 1. There's a lot of movies that are excellent films. There's a reason the universe made the money that it did. But it is not, a pantheon is not even really a Mount Rushmore. It's a one of one in our opinion. And it's this one, Captain America Winter Soldier. And I think there's so many things important about this movie that as we're 10 years out, Pablo, make it even better today than it was when it first came out. The biggest thing I remember when I watched this for the first time um, was the pace. There was something, there was something about the way this movie was shot and the way it flowed where I remember getting to the end of the movie and being like, wait, that was two hours. That felt like 20 minutes. The movie flies. And I, it just had a different feel and rhythm than anything else that I had seen, including like, you know, Avengers one, which, which had, which had already come out two years earlier and Iron Man one. And those were great experiences. And like Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight movies, like very different. Like this thing cooked from start to finish. And in my mind, it's not only the best movie they made, I think it's the most rewatchable movie. I think it is the movie that you, if you see it on television, you can go into that movie anywhere. And start from anywhere. You can start anywhere. from the credits. And if you only want to watch for 10 minutes, you're going to see something great <laughs> before you step out again. And it's the only movie I think I can say that about in this in this universe. And that's such a rare class. So that's what I remember. The pace. It just it was perfect from start to finish. What did you think of that first sequence? With Captain America and them taking out that that boat or that ship. But it wasn't even Brian. The way Chris Evans played cap is when it was time to work it was time to work and this is what we're doing and that was the end of it and everybody was like he was captain america brian and when he just flew when he just jumped out the plane and they looked at him like yo that's you know that's captain america that's him i agree i also think we'll get into this in terms of structure i think they did something incredibly smart and a little bit unusual which is i think this scene is what 99% of movies, 99% of filmmakers would have opened the movie with. And I think it was brilliant that they didn't. I think the scene at the beginning where he meets Sam sets an incredible tone for this film that character matters because they build that rapport after that quite humorous run. And this is back when Marvel could be like legitimately funny. It is funny watching Chris Evans yeah. zoom by him. <laughs> <laughs> on the mall that is actually legitimately funny but you see them develop a chemistry just for those two three minutes yeah. and you get that communication of he's got the little notepad and he's trying to get back in the world and you know he met the marvin gay reference and then and then it's time to work 
And so I think putting Little Mermaid Star after that is so smart, yeah. but actually I think most action movies would have put the fight that first. Little Mermaid Star in the beginning. And yeah, set the right. tone with the action. He interplays with Sam. Then he gets on the Quinjet. He's got a rapport with Natasha. Natasha's trying to get him a date. Like they're kind of like small talking. Yeah. And then he goes and fights on the boat and you realize, oh, he does have this other relationship with uh, Rumlow as well with with Strike Team, which is a little more uneasy, but like you sort of see them working together. I think it's so smart how they just use these little snippets to be like, there's a real human connection of sorts across all these characters, even right down to Jasper Sitwell, who then gets later revealed to be a mole effectively, trash talking the terrorists. <laughs> Everything is planted there for a reason. Including, and then to your point about that's Captain America, I do like that he has an ego because when Batroc faces him and challenges him, he's like, all right, I'll take off my, I'll take off, <laughs> put down my shield and I'll put my shield away, take off my hat and I'll kick your ass anyway. Like that's yeah, hero yeah. stuff that we yeah. like. But you're right. Uh, his interaction with everyone is pretty different. And that's what's unique about Cap. Very interesting. And that continues right because we segue from that scene right to his conversation with Nick Fury, which I think is one of the high points of the MCU. When he basically go This was at his apartment? No, in the office. When he basically goes in and when he's like, ah, you know, basically I'm tired of being your tired of being the janitor. Yeah. And then Sam Jackson gives him the perspective, which leads to him the which leads to Shield takes the world as it is, not how we'd like it to be, which is, I think, is one of like the top five lines in in MCU history. But like that interplay is critical to this film and critical to Cap sort of his sense of honor versus the gray areas in which the world operates. And I would argue, Pablo, those are the scenes that Marvel doesn't do anymore. And if they do, they don't do them right. well. That you absolutely right. You absolutely right. Anybody in the comments that disagrees with that is out of their mind because the Marvels does not do that. Thor Ragnarok has moments but doesn't do that. We only care. We'll get about Thor Ragnarok because those these are the movies, Brian, that people consider as their number one. So I want to not tear them down, but tell you why they're not my number one. Or your number ones, bro. I think so. I mean, this is where I think, like, I would say Marcus and McFeely are sort of the unsung heroes of Marvel history because they wrote First Avenger and then they really kind of hit their stride with this movie. And then they write Civil War, they write Infinity War, they write Endgame, and they're gone now. And I just, those names don't get brought up enough in terms of what's changed. Everyone kind of is asking for the Russos back. And I'm kind of like, I've seen the Russo's other work. I don't want the Russo's back unless these two guys are coming back to write for them. My opinion. But this is good writing. Like this is and they they said from the very beginning they wanted a modern story. They wanted a conflicted story. They used 70s political thriller kind of gray area type films as the inspiration and you can feel it. Like this is not a, you know, this is not 3 you know, this is not like even though Redford's in it this is not a Redford, all the president's men type of movie, but it does have that feel of being political without being political in, 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 in the yeah, traditional yeah, sense. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's, yeah. I just like that those scenes are not sacrificed ever in this movie. They had that Bond, uh, Mission Impossible type, in that, that world, you know, but in the MCU. And it's funny you say that. They, they said did. Brian De Palma's Mission Impossible 1 is one of the templates for this movie. So there you go. There you go. I knew nothing. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about what was what, what what other scene? What came, what scene came after that? Well, I mean, they have the whole discussion about this is not freedom, this is fear. I mean, honestly, this is where I think the movie ages really well because, like, you look at what's going on in the world today, and the, this conversation is one that you could have now about a lot of what's going yeah. on, and just change a few of the change a few of the the characters of the words. But I think the introduction of Alexander Pierce is. Awesome. I mean, Redford is still Redford, and he reminds you of that instantly when he's talking to this sort of mysterious council about, you know, Project Insight and what to do. So then you get like his relationship with Nick, then you get his relationship with Cap, you get Cap's relationship with Sharon Carter. Like, you know, Cap has a moment with Peggy. This is what I mean, people. This is an action movie, but I'm rattling off to you all the human stuff that holds this together, and they never miss. And I thought it was interesting. I found in the notes, 
they spent a lot of time and had a lot of big name actresses who were under consideration to be the love interest for Steve in this movie. And if you notice, there really isn't one. There's a little Thank flirtation you. with Agent 13. Yes. There's a moment with Peggy to wrap that up. But what a smart decision to not have a true romantic lead because this movie would not have worked as well if they yeah. had it. It would have taken away a bit from what was actually going on. And it would have taken away from, honestly, if we're talking about who are the romantic leads, it's him and Natasha. It's him and Sam. Like those, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the love. Those like guys, him and Nick even, yeah, right? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wouldn't work with like a, an actual new Peggy Carter in this movie. It would not have worked. I guess, Brian, the scene that I that pops into my head that establishes for me, Brian, Nick Fury was the, his escape from after he has his conversation with uh, Peter. Yes, go ahead. And then we'll, I have a question for you after that. So. You know what's crazy? When I was uh, listening to the audio book for the Reign of the MCU, they sort of talk about that whole scene and how that whole scene was created and little bits and pieces of that you actually get in the movie about about what capabilities the truck that he was driving <laughs> had were actual things that they were trying to actually do but they didn't actually make it in the film and they just wrote it in there and i guess his survival instincts brian Nick Fury doing everything he has at his disposal to get away yeah. until we get arrive at this, this, this capital. Well, this is the, again, writing has to match up with action. You can't have a payoff line at the end of the film that says, if you want to stay ahead of me, you got to keep both eyes open and then have a guy who's klutzing around all the time. He has to be a step ahead. And like, even when he's outgunned and seemingly cornered, he's a step ahead getting out of the vehicle. He's a step ahead faking his yeah. own death. Like you, you see the yeah. genius of the spy yeah. before he then shows up at the end in this triumphant return. Like this is how you have to write yeah. this, right? So many movies now would yeah. have the line and then you look back at the two hours of work and be like, this dude's a fool. I, here's my question for you, because this is a great set piece, this, this race through DC that results in Winter Soldier exploding the vehicle. Remember when Marvel could do awesome action and didn't need a lot of computers? Yeah. So if you had to draft, and I'll just use the segue now, if you had to draft, I think this movie probably has five, maybe six. So I'll give you the Lemurian star attack, Nick Fury's escape through DC, Bucky versus Steve on the rooftops after Nick is shot. The highway chase, which leads to Bucky's reveal and hand-to-hand -hand with Steve. Um, there's obviously the final assault with the three helicarriers. And then, of course, there's the elevator scene going into the motorcycle versus the Quint. That's in the same movie. So if I said, what's your, I give you the number one overall pick, which action set piece are you taking from this movie? The one, I mean, all of them are great, Brian. The elevator scene is obvious. It, 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 you can debate that one all day with people, but I think just the hand-to-hand -hand combat between him and Winter Soldier, and just, you know what scene was dope, Brian? When, how Natasha escapes, when she throws herself and she escapes and she's, oh my, you saw how flawless that joint was, yo? <laughs> She was just gliding and she just ran doo -doo in stride. It was just no stumbling. It was just perfect. I haven't seen nothing like that in a while since, I don't know. I mean, we've seen some good stuff after, some great sequences after, but nothing as, as memorable as those. So this is why we're friends, because that's my number one pick. I think the consensus would be the elevator yeah. and the motorcycle Quinjet. I think most people would take that one. And I don't. That's no, no, no shame uh, on that scene, which is amazing. Yeah, and I, yeah, I read, yeah. I went back and I read the Russo's approach to this, which I thought was interesting. They said they deliberately wanted to avoid a lot of quick cut over edit in their action scenes for this movie. They wanted longer tracking shots and continuous footage. So not quite as extreme as the daredevil high hallway fight scene, right? Single camp. But that same spirit of like, let the camera play and let's just roll the scene. And I think it works over and over again in this film. But I agree with you. I think the highway fight leading to Winter Soldier versus Steve 
the punch into the shield, the reveal of who he is. But yes, Natasha gets a moment in this. Falcon gets a moment in this. Like, I think it's perfect. I think it it, it is that Jean Claude Van Damme back kick into Bolo <laughs> stomach. Come on, but man. then there's also a mortality, right? Because Natasha's wounded. She's shot during this scene. Like Steve takes damage. I mean, as as much as he can take damage. Like this scene has like real gravity, where you're like, okay, somebody might be struggling here. And we've already, you know, you assume Nick Fury's not dead somehow, but like you've already seen this moment of like he's been taken off the board earlier in the film. So, yeah, no, I'm. Uh, this would be my number one pick. I think it's literally the best. I think it's the one of the best action sequences I've seen in a long time in a film, superhero or otherwise. Um, and I just love the I love the beats. And it looks to your point, yeah. everything looks real. <laughs> oh man. And by the way, that's what wasn't in Black Widow, the movie. That. Yeah. Her doing yeah. that enough. They get free. They, they they're caught. Um, is the next scene that they, they're in the the the, the truck? Yeah, the, the kind of the, the Maria Hill sort of appearance and rescue, which leads to the Nick to the Nick Fury reveal. Um but again, like that leads to, I think, a great, you know, round the table conversation about what exactly is the objective here. Right. And, and Fury is trying to defend the honor of S.H.I.E.L.D. And now Cap is completely outside the system. Right. And he's saying, no, it all goes like I'm taking it all down. And that's such a big transformation for the ultimate soldier to be like, no, I'm ripping, I'm, you know, I'm ripping the whole system apart. All of it got to go down. Yeah. yeah. I mentioned this very briefly, I think, when Freddie was on the other day. I had mentioned the, the fact that First Avenger had done so much of the legwork for this movie with the relationship between Steve and Bucky to where you didn't have to have a lot of yeah. flashbacks. I found a quote from Marcus and McFeely where they said originally, the original version of the script had a lot of flashbacks. And they edited them all out, realizing that it would ruin the pacing. So there it is. Like, we've talked about Marvel struggling in the editing room. Like, here's an example of Marvel getting it dead right in the editing room and saying, like, yeah, Winter Soldier, First Avenger did all the groundwork. We didn't need any more belief in their friendship. Like, trust Didn't us. they put some of the there's a little back towards the end? Yes. There's yes, a tiny yes, little yes, bit. Yes. They, found, they found the little place to put yeah they don't say what exactly they wrote they just said that there was a lot that they were clipped they were switching between the 40s and the and the current day a lot more in the original iteration than what we got for us brian that would have been like if they would have left it we we would have been like okay we get it they know and that pacing would have been off it would have been like the movie's now like herky-jerky a little bit the relationship between chris evans and, and natasha was very interesting Scarlet Scarjo looking like Scarjo. She was like they 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 did a fantastic job of making us get on us drawn into her. She just has that 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 charisma. She plays the role, Brian, that anybody can think, oh, she like me. <laughs> I'm sure Anthony Maggie was like <laughs> Well yeah, that first look where he's like <laughs> Yeah, he was like what, what, what is I'm he, pretty he, sure he what did you like, say? Can't run everywhere, Sam? And he's like, No, you can't. <laughs> It's like, what are you thinking there, buddy? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, but the way she plays that that role and and Chris Evans knows that she's hot because he makes a reference to that that bikini, that that scar that she has. Terrible in him, yeah. (laughs) How what what did you think of that relationship between those two and their I guess mission to sort of find out what's going on? Well, I think I think this is Scarlett Johansson's high point in the MCU. I really do. I think this is the best material she had to work with as the character. And the reason I say that is because what I always remember about this interplay is she always has an answer and a wisecrack for everything. But as the movie goes on, Steve's genuine, just sort of his genuine goodness and personality, you can see it starting to break her down a little bit to where like, when he saves her a couple of times and then she has that moment afterwards where she's questioning herself, where she's like, would you trust me if it was the other way around? She's almost basically saying like, I know you're for real. And like, you know who you are. And she's like, do I actually know who I am? Do I really know that? And she's been so assured of herself since we saw her in Iron Man 2 
that like I think this movie does a great job of of giving her that to then set up. You know, she has a great monologue. Don't forget, like at the end of this movie, it's not. You know, Steve Rogers gets his monologue when they take the assault on the helicarriers, but the final monologue of this movie is Black Widow before the Senate Oversight Committee. That's actually the big speech. They give it to her. And I, I think it rocks. So I actually love the performance and I love the relationship. And I love that like she definitely pushes him in certain directions that he's not comfortable with. But I think he pulls her also in the editing room because I went back to look at all the archives. Originally, Hawkeye's was in this script and Hawkeye was in this movie. And I think they wisely realized and they say, if he was in this movie, all he would have done is steal lines and scenes from Black Widow. And the relationship between Cap and Black Widow was much more important. And I think that even carries forward into like when they show up in, in, in Infinity War, who's Cap palling around with when he's exiled? It's Black Widow. They're tight. They're really good friends, right? And so when, when Black Widow checks out at the end, yes, she's longtime friends and best friends with Clint Barton, but it has an impact on Cap because we've seen the time they spent together. But I would question, Brian, how much, what was the impact on Cap when he found out that Natasha was gone? We were, we were talking about Endgame. Endgame. Yeah. I think shock. I mean, you kind of see, like, did she have any family? And then his, I forget who asked, did she have any family? And is it him that says us? It's Cap that says us, right? Yeah. And then even at the beginning of Endgame, when they're sitting around kind of like down on life, like, see, to me, the chemistry in those scenes is built in this movie. I think as far as, I don't know, Brian, if there's anything else you want to discuss regarding the movie. As far as third acts go, it's pretty good. Marvel always struggles with the third act. Oh, but yeah. the final fight in this one is pretty decent. Like they hold it together. The fights are good. You're, you're, and I think what really makes it roll for me is when he lets Bucky beat him to a pulp talking to like that's what does it right like, that's now, the thing that marvel fails right to always now. that's what makes the emotion come through the the explosions and 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 the martial arts and all that sort of stuff so i actually think as far as third acts go this was also about as good as as marvel got i'll say i'll probably say end game probably gets that title just because of the stakes but this movie it's a very appropriate ending for this movie when you think about when winter soldier bucky was swinging you remember I me? Mean, no, I don't. You know, <laughs> he was swinging. Yeah. And as he's lying there, you know, Cap is all beat up and stuff because, you know, Cap fought 10 dudes. <laughs> he's fighting one guy. Granted, he's a winter soldier. And he was, he, but he was getting the better of him, but he let himself get beat up. You know what I'm saying? They sold. That's what I'm saying, Brian. The performances here sold the reactions you would expect in the situations like that. They sold it. And like you said, and like and like what Cap Chris Evans said, we were playing to win. We were playing to win with every scene that you could see it. So that's why this movie is the number one movie. There was no, there's no other movie. Yeah, you can say Endgame, but Brian, why I would say why Endgame is not my number one to me, and this is going to be a reoccurring theme. <laughs> the Hulk. The, the Hulk, Hulk, yo. <laughs> For those of you that thought, that think we'll get to Endgame, but Thor Ragnarok, some people will say that's their number one movie. Thor Ragnarok was cool. The problem with that one for me, Brian, and this, and, and, and see, with Winter Soldier, you, they really know this. Mm, it's hard to find. You got to really think. You hear the Jeopardy music going on over and over again. It, it's hard. But with Thor Ragnarok, I can tell you immediately what's wrong with it, and I and what I don't like about it. The fact that they use the they use the Planet Hulk storyline for this, Brian, is upsetting. That's number one. Number two is the, the goofiness. Exactly. Yeah, I think they're almost in different genres, and it's just that's a matter of taste. I, I, that's a matter of taste. And like I think you and I tend to prefer movies where the, the humor is not as forced and not as prevalent. And like it's, you know, Winter Soldier is a serious movie that has humor. Thor Ragnarok's a silly movie that has serious moments. Like they're, they're kind of different. But some people love the, right? Like that's a matter of personal choice. So, but where I think Winter Soldier, you know, to put it in context, 
and I think people forget this, but I really want to say it. The MCU was not a sure thing when this movie came out. Yes, they had gotten to Avengers 1 and they had made a ton of money. But I'm telling you, Iron Man 3 is a polarizing movie in retrospect. That's 2013. Thor Dark World, most people have as a bottom two or three MCU movie in retrospect. That was Marvel's 2013. So they put out Avengers and then they put out those two movies. There was a legitimate... And they were coming with this Guardians of the Galaxy movie that people looked at and was like, really? Talking Raccoon? Tree? There were real questions. There were real questions as to the sustainability of this universe. And when this movie comes out in April of 2014, I'm telling you, the game changes. This is the movie that takes the roof off. And because you, you're kind of like, wait, this is possible? This is what superhero filmmaking can look like? It, I, you can't overstate that. Winter Soldier was, everything else from that was derivative of yes, that. Yes, 100%. The momentum into Endgame starts with this movie. This is where it begins. Infinity War, Brian. The Hulk doesn't want to come out. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the biggest problem for me. Other than that, Infinity War is a... Infinity, Infinity War is great. War. I actually like it slightly better than Endgame start to finish as a movie. Yes. I think Endgame... Yes. Degree of yes. difficulty, it's higher. Like what it's supposed to do, it's yes, incredible. Absolutely. Infinity War to me is slightly more rewatchable. But again, I, again, absolutely. Infinity War and Endgame are are kind of almost different movies than Winter Soldier. Like the purposes are different. So like again, those are great movies. I agree with you. The Hulk, we're both in that same camp of like it, they could have been better. He could have been better specifically. Um, but Winter Soldier gets its stakes right too. Like this isn't. A case where there's actually a quote from Kevin Feige where they talked about, you know, Winter Soldier's the villain in this. And obviously then you have like secondary villains like Strike and, and the Hydra people hiding in plain sight. There is no like supernatural villain in this. And Feige says that was by design, right? He was like, you know, Red, Red Skull was super powered effectively because of the experiments and, and, and so forth. This is another case where I think today, and I think we're going to see it sadly in Brave New World, Marvel understood who to put in the ring together and like cap fighting some super power giant monster or some like it just wouldn't have worked cap fighting his best friend ultimately that was perfect perfect table stakes and so i think this movie contains itself just right to where you're like we don't need the whole avengers team for this story we we got who we need in this movie yeah one brian i gotta talk about this too brian there was one action sequence that you left out. I don't think you mentioned it. Uh, very possible, because this movie has no bad sequences. So go ahead. What did I miss? The one that he, when he escapes, um, and he's on his motorcycle and he fights the plane. Oh, no, I, I attach that to the elevator scene. Because that to ah, me, okay, it starts okay. in the elevator and it ends with him defeating the Quinjet. So yes, those are, that to me is one scene. But yes. That Quinjet has so many hero shots. Brian. Oh, it's my favorite shot of him dropping off afterwards and looking back. It's perfect. Oh, <laughs> and now we talk about Endgame. <laughs> Brian, I was talking to a, a, a Diego. Shout outs to him. <clears throat> I said to him, you know how I would have ended Endgame with the Hulk? to sort of get some some redemption. I don't know if I mentioned it to you, Brian. He would have snapped everybody back. The Hulk is in a coma. Bruce Banner is in a mm. coma. The end credit scene is him waking up and he has this crazy look in his eye. That's how you do it. You don't end with the Hulk in a freaking sling, yo. He said he was made for it. Something else should have snapped his mind. Where you, then we get the Savage Hulk. I would have been happy with that. No longer, if the if the, if the, gaunt, if the gauntlet had sep had re separated him, that would have been great for the final fight. But no, he just snaps, and then he's just running in his underwear, just <laughs> in his onesie, <laughs> and that's it. We don't see him after that. All we just see him just throw his, tan his tantrums, throwing chairs and stuff. And it's also kind of one of those unresolved hero arcs because 
I love the scene where Thanos kicks his ass at the start of Infinity War. Oh, yeah, that one was dope. And they kind of leave that one hanging. Yeah, he never got his. There's an opportunity for a rematch. And he they don't, because of what they've done with the Hulk up to that point, there's no credible way for him to get in the ring and re- and rematch Thanos and and so redeem the Hulk himself. Got a L, bro. <laughs> exactly. He got an L and he didn't show up for the rematch. Yeah, and that was one of my biggest yo to this day. That's one of my biggest concerns. So Endgame doesn't get number one for that, yo. So y'all can have y'all number ones, but I can take him down. You can't take down the Winter Soldier, yo. Uh, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of <clears throat> thinking back to the Winter Soldier, man. What are your favorite moments? What are your best? What are you? Which actual sequence would you rewatch over and over and over again? Which actual sequence would, would you have to see over and over again? Um, who's your? Well, let us know. Is there who? What's your number one movie? First of all, and tell me why. Don't just tell me oh Thor because it was great. No, 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 no. I don't want to hear that. Tell me why you thought Infinity War was number one. I get it. Let me just let me just mention some of them to you already. You're going to say, oh, the end, the, that ending. Oh, yeah, I get it. The ending was. But the Hulk, man, I'm sorry, yo. When you think back to the Hulk, that's that. You know, my last takeaway from this film 10 years later is if people are familiar with this, Kevin Feige has a tradition that at the start of every Marvel production, he makes the entire cast and crew watch Richard Donner's Superman the movie because of the fun that they want to recapture and the magic they want to make. Hey, Kevin, I want you to make the cast and crew watch this movie at the start of every production because this was the high point of anything you've created. This is a perfect Marvel movie. And I want everyone who works on every other Marvel movie to stare at this and understand <laughs> what made it great before you start your next production. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys think. And we'll see you next time on the Ninja Room. The show goes on! Yeah!